I knew what Katrina did here was a result of a natural disaster. What I saw out there was a man-made disaster. Katrina gave uh, the government ammunition to tear down something that they had been planning for years and years to get rid of, which is public housing. In the aftermath of the, of the Katrina catastrophe, I think that you know a city looks at itself almost like an individual in a time of trauma. You, know, you say, am I leading the life I'm supposed to lead? Right now we've got 52% unemployment as it relates to African American males, right? But we're experiencing an economic boom. The mayor and too many of our business people wanted to market things for recovery, and that's what we got. Uh, we should have fought for a, uh, a, a community-based recovery. People when they think of New Orleans, they would just think that like, like we are a beacon, like just everything is just great here, um, but it's not. What we have to look at is the refusal to acknowledge race and the absolutely race silent or race averse um, approach to a lot of the way that the city and the um, federal government approach this. They see the Mardi Gras, you know, they look at the French quarters, all these things are truly happening. It has come back, for, but for the local people, the local people are not back. The local people are being pushed out of work, pushed out of housing, pushed into poverty. I'm Laura Flanders. This week we're in New Orleans, a city known for its music, its cuisine, its culture, and Hurricane Katrina. Ten years ago, 80% of this city was underwater. Since then, $71 billion in federal money has been spent. But has every opportunity been seized to bring back not just the place, but its people, so they're stronger and healthier than before? That's our question this week on The Laura Flanders Show. Well, we're standing here in the night ward, and what, 85% uh, of it is still vacant? Lieutenant General Russell Honoré, a Louisiana native, had just returned from Iraq when Katrina made landfall, and he was put in charge of the military rescue and relief efforts. The problem was people in the city needed to be evacuated, and there were people going in places to get food and water. Uh, but when somebody saw an aberrant person walking out of a store sometime, with a 52-inch TV in it, on his back in waist-deep water, that became the shot of the day for national and international news because the story became then about looting. And my job became put the guns down. Uh, these people need evacuation. They don't need guns pointed at them. Let us down, damn it! The devastation of New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina also revealed a corrupt and deadly criminal justice system. Every time I've been looking at the news for like the last couple of months, the more insulted and the more pissed off that I become as I look at the as I look at the um, police driving through my neighbor driving through our neighborhoods and making this making this making this making this make believe line that this the line that I cannot cross. I went in the bywater a couple of weeks ago. I grew up in the night wall. I'm talking about I'm an alien in the neighborhood that I grew up in before Katrina. Stand with Dignity is an organization of low income black workers fighting for economic and racial justice. The police that's in uniform have this have this have this have this pre existing idea that a black life or black or black rights or black black it, it don't exist. It don't exist. They don't have, they don't need no, they don't need no, they don't need no, they don't need no, they don't need no reason to stop me. You know, the thing is to organize because mm -hmm. uh, that's the missing ingredient that they, the people that's in power, the people that perpetuate these things, don't expect. We got to begin 
to take it, uh, take it upon ourselves to begin to look at ourselves. How can we begin to keep organizing and police our own communities? Post-storm, after the consent decree, uh, when Eric Holder came in here and looked at the actual mechanics of the, the police department, he, it, it became clear to everyone, oh, no, you're right. We haven't changed the way we're policing since uh, close to Reconstruction. Rosanna Cruz was one of those who fought for federal oversight of police in jail. The movement to transform the criminal justice system, which has been led by community members and people who have spent time back in those cells, um, has managed to make incredible strides forward. Milan Sherry helped write guidelines for the New Orleans Police Department aimed at preventing profiling of LGBT youth of color. We have a large rate of homeless LGBT, um, particularly trans youth, um, here in New Orleans. They face high rates of discrimination from employers, housing, like landlords, and just a huge, huge um, part comes from New Orleans Police Department. Police officers, vice crime officers, were targeting uh, transgender individuals, members of the LGBTQ community, uh, and accusing them or arresting them or stopping them to, to talk to them about uh, uh, whether or not there was, this was, prostitution was going on or what was going on, when in fact uh, the person was coming from classes at, at Delgado. At one point in time, it was like walking down, um, walking while transgender was a crime in New Orleans. For those girls that have been stopped, as far as like reporting back to us, um, their, their encounters with officers has been a lot different. Um, like I said, it's very it's small progress, but it's definitely some progress. The courthouse, the jail, the police department, they have not just a racial bias, but in some cases, an explicit uh, practice of discrimination against primarily African Americans and also Latinos and other um, immigrant communities. The Congress of Day Laborers, founded in 2006, has over 400 active members. They fight for economic justice and an end to police profiling. The fight that actually exists and the fight that I actually grew up in is that like these Latinos or these Mexicans are coming here to steal our work, that's not the real fight. And we work together to show, like to prove that, to understand the story as to who, who are oppressing us, who is locking black workers out of work, and who is taking Latino workers into work and exploiting them. ¿Cómo es que esto funciona? ¿Verdad? Vemos que ICE no trabajan ellos solos. Siempre dependen de otras agencias para hacer el trabajo sucio de ellos. Entonces, ahorita queremos hacer una dinámica para que veamos más o menos cómo es que esto funciona. We talk a lot, even though we don't share a language, we, we communicate with each other. And we realize that we have a lot of, like we talked about that culture that New Orleans have, and we talk about the culture that comes from being oppressed. Toya Lewis grew up in the Calliope Projects, also known as B.W. Cooper. Tearing down public housing disproportionately affected black women, who were the majority of residents. I grew up in uh, uptown in the Calliope Projects. Uh, and as we speak today, that the bulldozers are tearing down the uh, apartments I grew up in. One of New Orleans' fundamental problems is that it's too poor. It's too poor at every level. You know, even if you, um, it's just too poor at every level. Sean Cummings is a developer who's played a big role in reshaping the city's downtown. One of the things I think that New Orleans was challenged with uh, for many, many decades 
And then in the aftermath of Katrina, I had an opportunity to um, try and improve was the, the concentration of poverty in public housing developments. We tore down some of the most reliable, uh, sturdiest, hurricane-proof buildings in, in America. Oliver Thomas was city council president in the years after Katrina, and he joined a unanimous vote to tear the housing down. We fell for uh, HUD and the federal government's lie about one-for-one -one replacement and about using the money to uplift uh, working class and poor people. That still hasn't happened 10 years later. Coming up here in, uh, in the Calio project, it was a village. Coming up, we had gardens, we had, you know, people were close-knitted. I've realized now how much, how important community was back then, especially considering that it, it does not exist no more. And now they have uh, makeshift buildings, uh, Lego buildings, like walls that's already in place, just pick it up and push it up there and snap them together. Um, and that's what people are living in now. And they pretty. Like, they, they, they look good. They pretty. But they not worth shit. Hundreds of millions of dollars, much of it from the federal government, was spent to tear down public housing and build these so-called mixed-income residences. Citywide, only 7% of former public housing residents were able to live in these new developments. Hi, you was here when you Katrina? Yeah, I stayed here for uh, two weeks yeah. for Katrina. It was, I was swimming. Back helping people. Glenn Ross is one of the very few the former residents the still living here. This is some of the buildings. This is one of the buildings that I, I was able to work on. Right, this I was, a, they, I worked on a lot of these no, buildings out here myself. <laughs> I just framed it. The framework mm -hmm. that you see is my mm -hmm. framing, but yep. uh, this part wasn't done by me. Yep. It was a lot of cheap material. They saved it. And yep. You know, if you want to count on a look, the look is great. But the, um, the safeness, I, don't, I, can't, I can't give you a second, I mean, a, a great answer on the, uh, the, 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 the uh, strength that these, these places have. Are this, you afraid living in here? Yes. Oh, uh, absolutely. I'm afraid if Katrina come back, <laughs> because like Katrina, that. Katrina, uh, these places can't take what what those places took. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I mean, it's the difference because it's bricks, but it's just not sturdy enough. You know, it's not safe. Alfred Marshall, a former resident, has been fighting for his community to get jobs in the reconstruction. We had a lot of contracts that come in and make those commitments and don't stick to the commitments. Hey, I'm just a small guy. Randy Silliman is the contractor overseeing the job. You know, Randy, 39% of the children here in, in New Orleans are living in poverty. You know, the that income gap, and that ain't right. People that's in control need to share the wealth. You know, um, I know plenty of people making $10 an hour right now and can't pay their bills. $10 an hour and won't pay the bills. That's money, so why the locals are not being involved in the process of bringing New Orleans back or bringing Louisiana back? Alfred says government officials made promises they later broke. Corporations came in and made a commitment that to the 25% of the people that were left, that they would get the opportunity to rebuild their community, plus live in those, and live in those houses. But that didn't happen. Why do you think it happened this way? By design. It was all to get rid of public housing. These projects, at one point in time, house hardworking, working poor families. Um, they still house, uh, uh, just before the storm, hardworking, working poor families, but there was a stigma and there was uh, a thought process that anyone living in affordable housing was lazy and, 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 and sort of cheating the system. And that does a, a, a terrible injustice to the people that really are the backbone of our community. Our major industry is tourism, hospitality, restaurants, hotels, motels. Uh, and the folks who are working those jobs in the kitchen, making up the beds, cooking the food, uh, those folks are the working poor 
in this town. It's just for generations, they have not shared in the revenue uh, in those industries. Poor people are being moved out of this city. House prices in this neighborhood are going up by as much as 10% per year. The house right behind me, less than five years ago, sold for under $10,000. Today, you can rent it on the Airbnb website for $800 a night. We asked what could have been done differently for a more just recovery. Spoken word artist Asia Rainey founded the Oya Market as a collective project for black financial independence. It's about 50 plus entrepreneurs uh, represented from products like hair care, skin care, clothing, jewelry, all the way to visual artists, uh, photographers, uh, local authors, musicians. So it's a little bit of everybody from the community in this room. There's a lot of money that has been distributed in this city. Who's been getting all of those resources? The average grassroots organization, they don't even always have the resources to have a grant writer on staff or to even know how to navigate that system in a way where they could qualify for the grants that they need. So that's problematic to me. That's systemic. That's not because they didn't deserve it. Over here is the living space, living room. Uh, over here is the bathroom. Will be. This is actually the same place this community land trust in the mid-city neighborhood of New Orleans is one attempt to renovate and improve a neighborhood without removing the people who live there. So a land trust separates the land essentially from the buildings on, on the land, um, and it, the land is held in perpetuity, so it's very difficult to sell land in a land trust once it's in the, uh, within the organization, and that is designed that way on purpose. It's a way to uh, preserve affordability because you take the land out of the speculative equation. Katrina uh, made New Orleans really the test case for how to spend those federal dollars. There's another process that could have been done that brought in locals who had to evacuate, bring them back in into trailers, and which would allow them to come back to their home with their families and set up temporary communities in which they could have one worked on debris room because you don't you don't need a degree to uh, to, to to sweep up dirt or to, or to haul trash. I haven't had a lot of experience with how all of that money was spent, but um, I did have the privilege of helping to invest a portion of that in um, reinventing the riverfront in New Orleans, and uh, I think we spent that pretty well. I think the city's brand has been extended worldwide. Uh, even more deeply into the consciousness of people than it had been before. All sorts of young people coming here, filmmakers, furniture makers, glass casters, folks in the film industry, uh, entrepreneurs, startup companies. They want to live in these historic neighborhoods, often on the Mississippi River. A certain amount of gentrification, I think, is actually healthy for New Orleans. And now uh, the population is spread out and eliminated a lot of blight and uh, and crime that had existed in very proximate neighborhoods. So I think um, you just have to look at it at a little bit perhaps broader geographic perspective where folks uh, are displaced, where actually are they displaced? Does it not make it a more robust community? When we think about the ways in which we approach economic development in the city, it really is a historic, for lack of a better term, banana republic approach. We are giving it away um, for the benefit of those who will come here. And I really find that the mayor's approach, um, I, I tease him as the concierge in chief. Because of the damage that's been left by the oil and gas industry, we have less wetlands today than we had 20 years ago. And the wetlands are being lost as we speak by the hour. It's been supported by our Congress, multiple presidents in the White House, and all our governors. We're the second largest energy producer in America, and we're the second poorest state. So the state has been looted. You know, I seen where when we, they started to work in that local people that were here were not being able to work on the job site. That was literally across the street from the house. One of the ways they criminalize us, or one of the effects of them criminalizing us is keeping us away from uh, work and keeping us out of uh, uh, the economy and 
one of the biggest things that that's necessary in decriminalizing blackness is creating an uh, equitable economy. Black workers are usually the workers who, who are paid the less. We are the people who have more criminal history. It's obvious that that's not, that's definitely by design. First thing an employer tell them when they hand them the application, or the first thing they see when they sign in the application is, have you been convicted of a felony? Organizing looked different in New Orleans before more older black people trying to get their communities together. It wasn't no four foundations putting money in their pockets for them to do that. And they didn't have 501c3s. So, you know, they did it the way they knew how. They raised the money the way they knew how, and they did what they could do for their community. We're going to continue to organize. We're going to continue to fight back. But it was our job to, to fix the city and make it even better than it was before so that folks might wish to come back. I've heard people say when they go to New York, their heart beats faster. And I think when you come to New Orleans, I think it, it gives you rhythm if you don't have rhythm. Folks think that gumbo and red beans and rice is created in some restaurant in the French Quarter somewhere. No. If folks in the Lower Ninth Ward or on the West Bank or in these little neighborhoods, some grandmother's kitchen, weren't making those recipes, that stuff wouldn't exist. Period. New Orleans is the greatest collection of survivors ever. Poverty, malaria, flood of 1927, Betsy, Camille, Katrina, more poverty, more neglect, more disparity, mass incarceration in Louisiana and New Orleans, the highest per capita. So we've survived anyway. I think that the people who are trying to take trying to push people out, the people who are causing, I guess, gentrification is the word, um, know that they can't complete, they can't push everybody out. They need, they need somebody that's going to leave a bit of that culture. And, you know, I like to believe these oppressors are, are fucking smart. And they know that they're going to need to have some poor people somewhere to make sure that they have, have a taste of this culture and they could, like, steal it.